them in here. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I'll make a start. So tonight's <coughs> speakers are uh, Sarah Gaskell and Dr. John Fawcett, and they'll be collectively giving a presentation today. They'll be tag teaming through the presentation. Okay, where do I start? <laughs> so, many, many moons ago, Sarah studied environmental science in somewhere in the UK. Coventry. And following that, she began a career in an organisation when private pools still existed and memos took three days to, to get back to. She then got a role with a very, very long title, which was... Restoring Sustainable Extraction Technical Specialist. Restoring Sustainable Extraction Technical Specialist. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so she worked as an RSAP for a number of years in the field of hydrology. So she did a number of things with hydrology, including flood warning, and she made a number of radio appearances to issue some of these flood warnings. And then a uh, mini midlife crisis. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, an inquiring mind led Sarah to consider coming to work uh, in Australia. And she got a job at Melbourne Water, where she's worked for over five years. And in that five-year period, she's worked with the environmental flow team there. And I've had the pleasure of working with Sarah for at least four and a half of those years. And Sarah's done great things, not only in environmental flows, but also to build up uh, both a profile and a strategic <coughs> approach to how we manage groundwater and groundwater dependent ecosystems. Sorry, I lost the notes. But I think that, that, that did okay. Yeah, we next have Dr. John Fawcett. We never had any notes. No, <laughs> we never had any notes. Well, we had a good chat in the car on the way here. John studied geology and geotech technology. His training is in geology from the, Ballar from the Ballarat Uni. He, he has his degree from Ballarat Uni. And then he worked for a number of years. He worked for a number of years, that's right. <laughs> 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 yeah, I didn't go hungry. For uh, exploration geology and geotech. Before going yeah. to do a PhD. In 2004, where he was looking at degradation of Springs. Yes. I got the title right. Not yes. consistence of springs, but their degradation. <laughs> and the work that John did tested the, the prevailing theory about saline groundwater intrusion, rising water, rising water tables in the Hamilton area. About 30% correct so far. <laughs> <laughs> Following that, John took a job with BPI working in groundwater and he was instrumental there in developing uh, an understanding of where we had groundwater dependent ecosystems across the state of Victoria. And he, he was working in an area that produced the first map across Victoria of groundwater dependent ecosystems. Correct? Yep. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Um, following some time there, John then went to Jacobs, formerly SKM, where he thought he could better work in the area of groundwater dependent ecosystems and since that time I guess John has helped cultivate a paradigm shift in the way that we approach management of groundwater dependent ecosystems. Not only do we know where they are, where, where they are now, and John's had some work in um, developing a groundwater dependent ecosystem atlas across Australia and been instrumental in that, we also have an idea about how to manage them. I'm not going to say any more and I'll, I'll pass over to these two and they're going to tag team with their talk. And we'll hold off questions until the end. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Dan, for that kind of conversation. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I must admit, like, it's really exciting to share the journey that we've been on over the last um, few years. There's been very many movers and shakers in the GDE world, but working with John has been a pleasure. Um, and there's many other people that are working in this area. There's so many people in the room that I've had the pleasure to work with as well in many different capacities. Um, so yeah, we've got a talk of about three parts, John. So John's gonna muddy the waters in his traditional style. A bit of an introduction to GDE and management and its history. 
perhaps trying to stir the waters a little bit with the kind of program that we've developed at Melbourne Water, which is kind of being rolled out but across the state, which is great. And then we'll try and step you through a couple of examples using Deep Creek and Tukgaruk. So Deep Creek up at Lansfield and Tukgaruk on the Mornington Peninsula with some of the things we've done and perhaps some of the practical applications that we've um, undertaken. So John, you do. I'm going to probably cough a bit for this, I've been quite cold. Um, I give lots of talks at GDEs about how to map them and all that kind of stuff, but I've been thinking about um, changing what I talk about is why we actually have the acronym in the first place, because we don't have an acronym for surface water dependent ecosystem. We call them rivers. So why don't we have GDEs? Um, and hopefully I'll try and you know, drag that out. <coughs> and why is the, I suppose, the bottom line, why do we have to have initiatives around increasing the awareness of groundwater ecology? Why do we get to the point that the you know, groundwater actually fell off the ecological bandwagon? So that's you know, the kind of thing, I suppose, rather than rattling off you know, all the different kinds of DDEs now. You know, this acronym actually didn't exist. If you go back before, you know, 20 years ago, no one used the word DDE. So why, why do we have it? And do we need it? Is it a good thing? So groundwater as a concept is really, really old. So um, if you do Google how many times wells are used in the Bible, it's, it's a hell of a lot. So you know, you've got to be careful what you Google. Um, I was doing <laughs> Googling and this guy called Robert Banks. He put Rob Banks in it. <laughs> um, did some interesting stuff. <laughs> Good instruction. So we know from carbon dating the wooding wells, the Chinese have been digging wells for over 6,000 years. So we've been, you know, it's a long time. Climats are an amazing thing, subterranean tunnels. Um, we'll show an example of those, which are, it's an engineering way of getting groundwater, which is two and a half, three thousand years old. And we know from dream time stories, we know from our you know, local, local mobs around here, there's been laws around how to protect groundwater and groundwater discharge base. So the concept of groundwater and the engineering concept of it is actually really old and re probably older than the concept of surface water engineering because you have to go and get groundwater. It wasn't just there. You have to find a way of getting it out of the landscape. If you don't know what climats are, well, I don't know how to pronounce that properly, but they know 600 BC, they would dig a trench where they thought the mother well where they thought groundwater was. They would dig a, I don't know, a lateral trench that would drain the groundwater. They put air shafts in it. It was a pretty amazing place to dig and wonder what the LA Peninsula that was. <laughs> and they irrigate fields in Syria for you know, two and a half, three thousand years ago. They were growing food based on groundwater irrigation. They're amazing things. And there's a really good documentary on them by that Scottish scientist um, who was out here recently giving talks. So we've known how to get groundwater for a long time. We know that groundwater has actually maintained entire civilizations. So in Mexico, this is the limestone place. If you ever wondered about that meteorite that hit, that's actually the rim. Meteorite that hit Mexico, so it actually goes all the way up. You might have seen sh shows of guys scuba diving through these holes called cenotes, um, and they come out in the ocean. So, this area of Mexico, it's high rainfall, it's tropical, but there's no rivers because of the limestone, and entire civilizations were governed by groundwater. So, all they did, they drank groundwater, irrigated their crops. So, we've had a good connection with groundwater for a very long period of time. In the Australian context, um, understanding the groundwater in Northern Australia actually is really a beautiful thing. They actually try and integrate indigenous knowledge into it. So this is a groundwater or hydrological map, if you like. It's a cross section with a rainfall. There's a whole heap of dots with the springs and the spots. So Darwin is, is um, Darwin's up here and we're, we're down here. So a normal run of the mill <coughs> hydrological map showing you different aquifers and all, all that kind of stuff. All pretty dull and boring. But where you have the local knowledge in Australia and understanding things, you can zoom in to uh, a rainbow serpent, a spring, a well called Rainbow Serpent. And what they did when they built this hydrological map is that these stories, these Dreamtime stories, have owners. And you know, the Rainbow Serpent, which I'll go into sort of very briefly, they don't just talk about our concept of groundwater, I suppose, and the reliance on it. They actually went and got the owner of that story, a guy called Frank. And Frank owns the story of this actual waterhole. 
Um, and there's a lot, I won't go into the story, you're not actually really supposed to talk about those stories and stuff, but effectively the description is that in, in their understanding of groundwater, a serpent came from down deep, comes up, breaks a hole in the ground where, where the groundwater is. Other versions of that is that the rainbow serpent actually provides the semen, so when there's floods, then this can, can you know, propagate out within the landscape. That rainbow serpent is effectively groundwater coming up. So they actually had a pretty good concept of how these things you know, manifest themselves. So we understand groundwater, we understand that it maintains civilizations, and we've, had, we've lived in a landscape where they actually had you know, a, a deep understanding of the rules of where these actual you know, groundwater actually came from and the value of it. You know, it, it, that was the most precious thing to them because in that landscape down at the fry, that was the only place for water, the only place for food. Groundwater was actually really, also really important in gold rush. Ballarat was dying in gold rush. They ran out of water. There was a drought in the gold, gold rush period. And they're lucky enough around Ballarat, there's a lot of basalt. Um, so the first, if you, if you don't know, Crowsay was a guy who was in the engineering, logical engineering um, school of mines in Ballarat. And the first logical maps actually came out of Ballarat. And in those maps, they actually mapped springs. So we're integrating geology and springs, you know, 200 odd years ago. They found these springs and they drained them all to create Wilson's Reservoir and a whole of reservoirs near Ballarat. So we, we already knew the importance. And the, and the text here, this is an old text, uh, you know, the purity and abundance and permanence of the spring water. You know, these channels have um, undoubtedly unfolded our most valuable source of supply. So they were tapping in the groundwater before any reservoir had been built in Victoria. So it, it's a long history. So there's a clash that's occurred, it's a perfect storm, which I'll get to. In dry regions, during droughts, groundwater maintains half of it, has maintained half of its growth, it goes flooded. The issue with groundwater is it's out of mind and out of sight. We actually can't see it. We don't actually understand what it draws or what it draws up. Apart from springs, you know, groundwater is the saturated stuff that's you know beneath my feet, but we don't really know. Very difficult to achieve a balance. And this graph that Sarah put in down here is of where the dots and the other. And it's a over time, so the blue line is the number of new bores that were installed. And you can see the drought in 1966, there were no bores being put in prior to 1960. And you can see the blue lines, and that's the cumulative increase of groundwater bores in the small groundwater use area. So we really started to hit groundwater really, really hard. And at the start of this was around 1960s in terms of, of really trying to extrapolate it as a resource. So we knew it was a resource. We could go and get it now and we could use a lot of it as we could. In terms of coming back, you know, whatever reason, the ecological importance of it wasn't really there. If we look at strategies, we weren't really looking at how groundwater serves our ecosystem at all. We really hold it or manage it. I've got another bit more information about that in the future. There were political drivers that when you look at, if you get old, I'm over 40, you can look at trends in how the initiatives are actually around groundwater are associated with groundwater levels across the state. So I'm going to use the, the oldest bore I know in Victoria in monitoring. It was a bore put in by a guy called Phil McCumber. <coughs> Goes back to 1972, it's in, in the mid autumn region, and this is a hydrograph. This is how we look at groundwater levels going up and down. So we've got a long record. And this trend goes up. So we've got these bores were put in generally because of the result of the, the drought in the 60s and understanding what's going on. We have a static period, you know, we've got our drought, we've got our flood. But in terms of how we view groundwater in terms of policies and national initiatives, they follow this trend. So at this period, um, there was plenty of surface water, it was wet. Groundwater was a threat, as well as a resource. You had dry land salinity. You had the land and water audit, which sold Telstra. You spent a billion dollars to plant trees to stop all the recharge because there was this rise in tide and rise in water tables, which was very much overstated. We had Centre for Land Protection Research Programs, which is where I started to work at, which is all groundwater is going to cause environmental damage. And it's fundamentally because of the timing of where the groundwater level trend was. We have a drought. 
fantastic data is the hydrogeologist, the best data in the world is to have 10 years of no ground, right rain, because you understand how systems respond. All of a sudden, we've got this mixture of groundwater use increasing and no surface water. We've got this clash occurring in terms of policy. And then we've got a change in investment. We've got the National Water Initiative and NWIs, and we have massive federal investment, which we probably won't see again unless something dramatic happens, in groundwater atlases, <coughs> you know, in GDEs, the GD Atlas, and, and you know, to, to, be, to be blunt, the last three years, a lot of work I've been done has come out of this investment because of falling groundwater levels. And we started to see the impact of streams that are no longer connected to the groundwater. So the trend in groundwater actually controls the investment at, at a policy level. We have a flood. Everything's good. You know, I remember we were doing the upper lobbing groundwater management plan with Melbourne Murray Water, where we've got declining water levels and their bores are going dry and it's all, we've got to manage, we've got to have triggers. Halfway through that process, we had the wettest year in history in the local community group, but it's all fine, I don't even know why we're doing the groundwater management plan, it's fine. You're all wrong, because our, our reservoirs are filling again and our groundwater levels are rising. So, the policy shift. If you look at federal government funding, now Northern Australia faces this, because how are we going to get the two fold north? And if you look at it bluntly again, it's actually around coal seam gas. Even in Victoria, the funding is dominated by the concept is coal seam gas gas by the time to Victoria. So the third shift in policy, which is kind of related to the trend in groundwater, as in we're no longer seeing the stress about the resource or the ecosystem. But the reality is we shouldn't look too close, because groundwater levels are now falling out. We don't know where they're going to go into the future, we can't actually predict that. So that's an interesting timeline, it's actually where the, the, the concept of why ecology hasn't been considered, because the rate of rise and fall of the groundwater actually has influence on how we view policy. Policy drive funding. What happened in that drive period and why GDE and RIC, when we were at the deep drive, really matters and why we actually had to start to understand the importance of ecology and groundwater is that you summed up in this graph near the Lodden River. So the blue line, uh, the blue line is river flow at Newstead. So uh, post 2002, the river stopped flowing because it was dry, damp, we're using all the water. The red line is the cumulative rainfall. So Obviously, it's just declined post 1996, and the green line is a bore that is in the alluvial system that feeds the Lodden River. So, this period here, the river was gaining, a bit of pumping didn't matter. The river was always gaining, there's always a bit of groundwater going into the river, things are fine and dandy. Down here, through this period here, it's disconnected. So, we had acid sulfate soils within the Lodden River, we had a system that was losing. Um, the river wasn't flowing and we had consequences that came out of that. What does the consequence of that perfect storm look like? This is a, a wetland, it doesn't matter where it is. It was fed by groundwater and surface water. And that's an acid sulfate soil that had grown out. Um, it's the worst I've ever, ever seen. So it's just devastating. The so we actually started to see the true consequences of when we take groundwater away from ecosystems. So we actually have to do something. We have to understand the linkage of how groundwater is connected to these things. We actually have to develop management programs to take those things into account. In the past, that's the information that Sarah uh, gave. We've had lots of initiatives around managing groundwater as a resource. All those lists, all those policies, everything there is actually about uh, worrying about keeping that aquifer at a certain level that you can keep on exploiting it, or about interfering with your neighbour's poor. So since 1967, the Groundwater Act in 69, the 1999, the WSPA were areas that were intensive water use. We didn't want to keep on using them because groundwater levels were falling. It had nothing to do with ecology. It was about the resource and about interference with other users. It was about licensed rights. So we've been, you know, the policy has been there um, and change is continuing. We're, we're heading towards a new sort of paradigm, I suppose, in, you know, decades or so, BC. Uh, a change in the way we're managing groundwater in the state, but all those initiatives are really about managing resource. So where do GEs come from? Well, they've come slowly, um, but moving really, really rapidly. In 1994, the coag reforms are really important. They basically said that ecosystems have a right to water. That was the first time it was actually written down. Um, we've always sort of known that, but that was a statewide agreement. 
like it or not, um, Tom Hadden and Rick Evans came from 1998. Uh, GEs and the significance to Australia is probably the most referenced journal article on GEs in Australia, if not sort of broadly within the world. So the drought happened in 2006. Australian Journal of Botany, ironically, not the Groundwater Journal, actually did a special edition on GEs. So we actually, the literature, where people were researching it now, the universities were actually starting to head to it in this space and uh, looking at vegetation dynamics. The drought kept on continuing. Um, we had some statewide mapping, you know, CPI. For me, still, uh, regardless of being involved, the National Atlas for GEs was the largest federal government investment in a groundwater project that occurred was around GDE, let's put them on the map. At an IH meeting last year, one of the speakers said, it was, it was you know, in Victorian IH meeting in Victoria, GDEs were easy to manage, so somebody made a map. We actually now there, we actually have to take into account. In 2011, um, things are moving forward. Whether you know or not, there's actually a draft ministerial guidelines on GDEs, there's actually a ministerial paper that how we should deal with GEs in, in the application of life. So it's come a long, long way. We're doing projects, we're considering groundwater with an environmental flow recommendation. So you know, things are shifting the way we're actually trying to manage these, these approaches, manage, manage these ecosystems. So it's, it's, it's all good. So <laughs> I usually start the slide, what is a GE? Um, the map's something you've got to define it, and it took us a year to have every single state agree with that. It's a lot, of year of my life. So that's the definition of a GDA at the top there. Um, every time I put it up, it gets criticised, obviously, <laughs> um, because it seems too vague. People want it to have a vol volumetric, they want it to describe the sensitivity, they want it to be more, you know, I, I suppose more accurate in the way it describes. I like it because, um, it, it allows an ecosystem, which is a water dependent ecosystem, just to have groundwater as a container. It doesn't matter how much groundwater. So we're trying to get in. And, and it's simple. I mean, if you have every single state in the steering committee that meets once a month to work out a definition after a 12th meeting, that you've really done with the concept of trying to explain everything. So that's, that's the current agreed <coughs> national definition of what a GDE is. What do they look like? They can be they can vary. This is a tupa stream. It's, a tupa is a, 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 a it's, it's carbonate mineralisation. So this is all this entire landscape, the entire rocks, everything, the layered rocks are all formed by groundwater discharge. It's a groundwater discharge zone that's been precipitating out carbonate for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. The whole landscape is formed by groundwater. So this is one extent of what a GE actually is, where the groundwater, the chemistry of the groundwater has actually created that landscape, you can see the groundwater pouring out here out of the stream and it precipitates calcium carbonate. And then the groundwater actually then re erodes itself. So that's one extreme of what a GDE is, the entire landscape. And if you know, you know, the Lake Air or, or some of those you know, Australian Teaching Basin streams as well, those mountain streams, it's easy to see, easy to map, easy to understand. Um, there's different types, so I'll just, my favourite GGE. Um, so this is, you know, they can look like vegetation, that's some uh, cooler bars in Queensland that are, are used in groundwater. This is a GGE, a, a little water hole that I grew up in. I used to <laughs> shoot freckled ducks and hunt blackfish in that pool. Um, <laughs> hopefully this is, some blackfish are still there, but in my entire life, that's a farm where I grew up in. That pool never changed levels. That's why we always went to the Yabbing Pit, because it was fed by groundwater. These dudes here are cool. I don't know the proper name. It's down in Tassie. Um, they're the biggest inland crayfish in the world. They get to a metre long. Um, that's a guy called Sean Thurston. He got that out with a leg of lamb and a rope. <laughs> um, and they tag them. They taste really good and they're really, really rare. And they won't tell you where they live anymore. But they're an extremely rare kind of crayfish because it tastes like it's really good. You can imagine that on the barbecue for the girls. <laughs> the, from the Vertican, I think the Vertican, the loggerhead turtle, this is a sad story. Um, here's the ocean, here's a sand dune. They walk in and they dig their burrow, two burrows to lay their eggs. The water table, if you've ever made sandcastles as a kid, if you don't get the right moisture, the sandcastle doesn't work. 
and lowered the water table and all the changes flat. So only for a day of its living life does a turtle get associated with groundwater, but the <coughs> moisture regime that actually keeps them alive. And that's a GDE as much as that other main fact. The point is, it's, it, it isn't the obvious GDE that we're trying to manage. Ecology is really complex, and, and whether you do terrestrial vegetation or aquatic vegetation or whatever it is, you know, little frogs that will come to. It's the little connections that we're trying to understand and how to manage groundwater between the ecosystems and why we actually need to have the acronyms for the moment to make people realise the connection. This little one has come along recently, some work of recent digs to Melbourne Water. There was some research going at, at, at Jeffy. And we'd mapped this area of where we thought the stream was gaining because we were under the, the impression that you know, the gaining stream had some water and the frog was there because it was persisting because the water was there. Yes, we can. Well, of course not. Louise is in the room. Um, yes, Louise is in, in the room from the Mary Catcher. What the researchers found out is, is that there was a fungus that was killing the frog and it was, it was resilient to the fungus or the fungus didn't actually work very well in slightly saline warm water, which is groundwater discharge levels. So the population of the frog was persisting because the groundwater discharge because it felt that the fungus that was killing it. It wasn't that it was dependent on the groundwater, it wanted to be there, all the other populations were probably dying, and that's where the persistent population of the frog actually was, the discharge level. So the connection about an important frog species, which is rare, we'd done the map with Sarah Hurd in the audience tonight, we'd mapped this area through here in Mary Creek, which we thought was gaining, there were some springs, and that's where the important you know, GEs were going to be, we didn't really know what they were, we knew there was a frog there. So we know this frog is here because of that groundwater discharge and how it actually deals with that pathogen which is actually killing it. So there's really, really subtle relationships in nature which we know. And you know, understanding that link, you know, by using that acronym, you know, we actually are able to integrate groundwater into these surface ecosystems and why we don't want, for lack of better words, to you know, urbanise or put a drawdown and stop that groundwater discharge. If you stop that groundwater discharge, that stream becomes very, very fresh and cold, and then the pathogen can actually come in and kill the little froggy, which no one wants. And now, we're going to stir the water. Not at all. <laughs> well, that was a bad I always learn something from Jeff. Didn't get the phrase kooky in the So he's kooky, Sarah Gaskell. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so as John's explained, the GDs are pretty, um, pretty complicated, and uh, where are they? Why do they persist in the environment? And I guess I'm just showing you the journey that I've been on over the last sort of five and a half years with Melbourne Water, developing what we've called our Groundwater Dependent Ecosystems Program. So why are we interested in groundwater from a Melbourne Water perspective? Um, we don't know that much about it. We know it persists in the environment. As John said, we've learned a lot over the years where it pops up, the role that it serves. A lot of question marks about the role that groundwater plays. We know we've got some ministerial direction, we know we've got the Water Act where and the water licensing you've got to take into account certain ecological features. Some of the sustainable water strategies give us direction on understanding the role that groundwater plays in GDEs. There was some early um, sorry, policy paper from, from DEPI. Melbourne Water's own healthy waterways strategy has actually got a target in there to deliver our GDE programme, which I'll come on to. And the statewide strategy has also got elements um, in there about understanding the role that groundwater plays. From our perspective in the environmental flows team, it's quite critical, critical to understand where the gaining and the losing reaches are. If we make a release from the air and it almost disappears to the groundwater, that's not that's not so good. We're making losing, um, making releases down losing stretches. John presented back today on some work we're doing in in Werribee, which is really interesting, where we're making releases down gaining and losing sections. So it's trying to understand the assets that we've got and their reliance on groundwater. A lot of it, as you know, it's time and money to do a groundwater uh, model. We've been working with um, Ben and Alison from Water Tech on a groundwater model. It's expensive, it's time consuming. How much data should we got to make a groundwater model make sense? We've got many risks in the catchment, the, 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 the growth that Melbourne um, faces in the northern, the southeast and the western growth corridor, that's going to reduce imperviousness, that's going to reduce recharge to groundwater and subsequent discharge. We might not see it in one year, it might be 50, 10, 100 years, it depends on the growth path, on the flow path, but it's all a risk. So at the end of the day, we're trying to understand 
where our high value and high risk groundwater dependent ecosystems are and what we can learn about them and at the end of the day what activities we can deliver on the ground to, to help these guys along a bit. So we developed a programme, as every good programme it's got a vision. Um, so we're trying to enhance, protect our waterway values by managing GDEs. We're trying to make sure that we're pro pro proactively managing GDEs. Um, at Melbourne Water we'll get a referral from Southern Royal Water about a groundwater extraction. We don't want to be just sort of reactive, reactive, reactive. We want to be on the front foot saying we value this site and work with those guys as well to understand the resource. So we've developed a programme. The key words in this is priority groundwater areas. We want to be targeting our investment and our time. We want to be using strong science, working with many of you guys in the room, to have this proactive approach. So we're on the front, the front foot about everything. We want to develop those on-ground management actions because if you're just looking at it and you're not doing anything, what's the point in being here? So you know, working with friends groups, working with landowners to perhaps you just fence out GD, perhaps the best, that's the best we can do for it. But what are the management actions that we can do on the ground? Very keen on our customers at Melbourne Water, so working <laughs> with our customers and stakeholders um, out there to find out those innovative solutions. So, if you just play bullshit bingo, you can shout bingo around because it's got some great words in there. <laughs> seriously, there's some really good um, key values and what we really want to achieve. So, uh, and it's working together that we actually do achieve this kind of work through knowledge sharing, such as tonight. So, there are four areas to the program. One's about understanding, next is about planning, looking at engaging, and then the final option uh, program is delivering. So the understanding bit is about building our knowledge and understanding. Where are our GDEs? What are the actions required to protect and enhance them? So we're trying to work out, map them in the environment. The next bit is about, we've mapped them all. Where are our high value, high risk ones? It's about prioritising those GDEs to sort of guide our efforts to manage the GDEs. The next bit is about ex knowledge exchange. So we've identified a high value, high risk GDE, but what do we know about it? What makes it tick? If you took groundwater away from that site, what would happen. Then the last bit is actually to do some delivery work on the ground, so, so to actually deliver actions um, on the ground. So tonight's presentation is going to go through these four steps and when John and I get through a bit of a double act in a minute, we'll be going through each of those steps and some of the tools we've developed to get there. The programme works on the principles of value, risk, priority and appropriate. So we want to be focused on those high value, high risk sites that are high priority and an appropriate level of investment. So we've got um, the programme area, the aims, the process, the documents. Now where you see the little broom, um, this links to a phrase my mum told me the other week, but it's about um, a new broom sweeps clean, but an old broom knows the corners. So they might sound as if they're new documents, but we're using knowledge and innovation as tried and tested. So where you see the broom, there's a little tool that we can actually use to um, describe what we've done. So just stepping through that, um, we've got understanding, planning, engaging and delivering. We've just gone through the aims of those, building our knowledge. And in the understanding part, it's about <coughs> investigating the site, knowing those priority GDEs are. It's about we've developed a GD workspace and a catalogue. It's about prioritising those GDs. So John and I will come and explain what we've done there in a little while. Next bit is about prioritising those efforts. So we've actually we've mapped 400 odd GDs, but they're all potential. We actually need to go out and work out if they are a GDE, or if it's a leaking farm dam that's got some non-native vegetation and there's no groundwater connection at all. So we developed, and Lisa's in the room tonight because this is her her baby. A bit of a desktop assessment, a field assessment, a GD handbook and a GD catalogue. So those are all new brooms, those are all tools that we can share with you. A um, bit of knowledge ex exchange, um, this is the conceptual understanding. We've mapped the GD, we've gone out and had a look at it, we think groundwater's playing a role here. Let's find out a bit more. This is some of the work that John's just described. We worked on a project with Louisa on Mary and Darabin Creek, but a conceptual understanding. How, what makes that site tick? Producing these um, wonderful communications tools. Also, we're trying to work out how our GDs are travelling. So we've done a bit of a GD condition assessment. So we've worked with Bill Pappas at ARI to adapt the index of wetland condition for a groundwater composure component. So over the years, can we say our GDs are doing okay? Or if one's going downhill, that's where we need to start looking at it a bit further. 
And then the delivery aspect, at the end of it, we want to deliver a management plan with management objectives. We want to look at what can be done at a local scale around that GDE, at the groundwater catchment, which may be working with Southern River Water about referrals, maybe working with planning about um, planning councils about overlays, it may be looking at um, development, and on a regional scale. So it's trying to capture everything and then work with our River Health guys or influence our customers, stakeholders and partners to actually deliver and help these guys out. So where are our priority areas? The way we've gone about this is we've mapped the location of GDEs. So wetlands, rivers, and we're going to look at terrestrial vegetation, but we park that for the moment, it looks a bit, a bit hard. But we've mapped our drought refuge reaches and we've mapped our wetlands that we think have got a groundwater component. We've also mapped through some work that GHD did back in 2012, the groundwater catchment, so the recharge area. So you've got a discharge point, what's the recharge area? Some of those flow paths are very long, which I'll come on to in a bit. By adding value and risk to that process, we end up with our priority areas. And the programme is all about monitoring, reviewing, evaluating this continuous adaptive management that we're trying to bring throughout the programme all the way through. Some of the data we've got, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, but this is a wonderful map. Did you do this, John? In 1968? <laughs> <laughs> um, John touched on 68 with groundwater um, drought. And this is some wonderful work that the State Rivers Authority did. I actually can't see it that well, but the darker lines are where the rivers and the creeks were still flowing, giving us some indication that perhaps the groundwater is still providing a source in the area. The nice part about map is that the government actually sent people out physically to go and map it. Yeah. The bit that they said, there were people walking through all those streams and invested that time to actually understand it. So that, I mean, that's invaluable for our assets. That's gold, that's absolutely gold. This is back that new, you know, you know, the new broom sweeps the, the, the old one. The old one. Yeah, the you know, we knew about this stuff um, back then. <coughs> what we've done at Melbourne Water, we've um, actually mapped um, the, the green areas that you can see on this, and what we call our drought re refuge reaches. So at the peak of the drought, our River Health officers got together and said, oh, that creek was still flowing there before we think there's a, an influence of, of groundwater. So those are the, the, the green lines. The sort of, I don't know what you call it, aqua, the, you see the billabongs along the Yarra here and all the volcanic plains out west, uh, is based on some DEFI wetland mapping. And we've just recently updated this with their latest wetland mapping. Other pieces of inf information on this map is some of the groundwater management areas. So you've got Kibi Rup in here, um, quite a large intense use of groundwater. Um, Wondinyalik, which is where the map came from before. So you're just demonstrating here what we think we know about where um, our GDEs are. So that's where we think the discharge point is. Um, GHG did some fantastic work for us in 2012 and mapped the groundwater catchments. I don't know if Tony knows more about this than I do, but using flow path particle tracking, something like that. But that's the groundwater catchment that actually contributes, in this case, to the drought refuge reaches. So if you look in at Deep Creek up here, we think this flow path there is, that's where the groundwater is flowing to that discharge point. It gives us a really good idea of the potential influence of activities in that catchment area. Can we just jump in? Sure. The point of making a map. And it's the same by a guy, Cliff Holly, up here with the map makers, is you can't actually drown them until you sit out of the boat. So, you, every time you make a map, it's wrong. Everybody, it's an old pun in geological mapping, every single geological map is full of salt. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, to actually do this map, you've got to define what's going to happen. Sorry, that's bad. <coughs> anyway, so the definition of a GD has to get done for whether it's right or wrong. And once you make a map, you can prioritise. But the whole thing starts with defining what the actual issue is that you're mapping. Otherwise, you can't map anything. And it'll overestimate or underestimate in listings, all that kind of stuff. But the whole move it forward, and the program that Sarah was talking about two, three years ago, yeah? Mm -hmm. Three years ago, someone said, we're going to actually develop that. There's not many other agencies really in Australia that have got that kind of, it, it, you just wouldn't have been thought about three years ago. You think of that. So by defining what a GD is and actually making a map, it enables all these other policy things to come from. But you have to map the ecosystem. So the, the, the final term is a really important component of enabling GDEs to actually turn into a policy that's positive. Yeah, yeah. That's 
suppose for us, the map that we produced around about um, 2010, we were running down the same kind of principles that the national mapping was doing. So I suppose we've got the luxury of having two GDE maps. We've got the ones we know about, which have got some local interests and local knowledge. Um, and then there's also the, the BOM GDE um, atlas, which is really, really good. They just have a look at that. Um, and then just looking in a similar line, looking at the groundwater catchments for the wetlands, um, you can see some of the different um, lengths of flow paths. And for the rest of the presentation, we're going to be looking here at the Brook, which is out of the Mornington Peninsula, and also at the Drought Refuge Reach at Deep Creek. And perch, trying to understand um, why they're hanging out there. We won't spoil the story. Um, and then the other interest for us is, is the high value wetlands that we've got out at uh, Church Brook. So um, we will just sort of step through the. It's um, that's a Tony's photo. I can't say to all gems, but um, at the end of every rainbow, there's a drilling rig. I think. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I'll come on to that. That's just some monitoring work that GHG have been doing for us. Um, it's taken a long point to get a hole in the ground, but it's fantastic. So we'll just um, step through the the process that we've got. So in the top right hand corner you can see those four areas. We understand, plan, engage and deliver. And I'm just going to step through some of the things that we've developed um, and that we're sharing um, across the state. So the first bit we mentioned, we mentioned about the GDE workspace. So this is mapping the GDEs, the wetlands, the drought refuge reaches. It has those groundwater catchments, it has depth to groundwater, it has the time of travel. So the time from rainfall to discharge. Some of the flow paths out west are very, very long um, travel times. It talks a bit about stream interaction. Um, an ENSIM model was produced, which is a DEPI project, um, which was able to do some of this gaining and losing streams for us. It's a starting point. It's regional model, it's regionally, um, regional data, but it's a great starting point. So we've got some hydrological and hydrogeological deep information on that, and this is what we'll be sharing throughout the business. Attached to that, we've got a GDE catalogue. So as I said, we've got about 400 GDEs, potential GDEs, um, but we've got this catalogue that sits behind it. And all those attributes line up to the National Atlas. So if we were to export our stuff to BOM, it should be seamless. We haven't tried that yet. <laughs> and also it's updatable. So as we go out and have a look about a site, we learn about it, we can update it. Just one, sorry, so on the, sure. the attributes, there's actually a national system now on how to describe and classify GDEs. We don't actually have to make up language anymore. Like the National Aquifer Framework, the soils people, you don't have to have equivalents like we used to have the name of an aquifer, but you'd have a statewide border and then on the other side of the statewide border would have a different name. Those days are heading past us. So one of the things about the National Atlas is that when we're trying to describe these systems, we can actually go and get them adopted terminology. And that didn't exist beforehand either. So when we describe a GDE, we don't have to go, how am I going to describe this? We can catalogue a line to come up with that. The national framework. So what the workspace looks like for Deep Creek looks a bit crazy. Um, and John will explain a bit more about the geology as we go on, but this is some of the information that we can pull out. So we've got Deep Creek um, map through just here, just as a river reach, and then this is the, the, the edge of the groundwater catchment. The red is um, a one year um, time of travel, I think the orange is um, up to 20, I think the yellow is up to 50 and, and grey's grays beyond that. So you can see that there's some quite responsive parts of Deep Creek and there's some other kind of slow paths, but we won't spoil the Deep Creek story because this is all we know at this point in time. Um, and then looking at a very similar, um, I haven't got scale on that, that's a bit um, not very good. Um, but Deep Creek, well, um, sort of rope, sorry, you can once again see the groundwater flow paths and we'll come on to explain a little bit more about how we think Deep Creek works. So currently we've got about 400 GDEs, we've mapped them. But the next thing we really need to do is prioritise those GDEs. Yeah, so, um, we have a map, lots of GDEs, lots of green blocks on the map, and we can't manage them all. So we did a straightforward risk analysis and the prioritising. So on the, the likelihood was which GDEs are susceptible to the management, and the management was really around groundwater extraction and, and, and other risks. So we had the likelihood of a threat occurring. And the key thing is the consequence where we looked at all the attributes of value. Um, you know, it's a, 
whether it's a rando, what it is, and whether that particular wetland might be sensitive, whether it's about sulfate soils, um, whether it's got an additional source of water, whatever that might be, and that's the consequence. So we've got a high value GDE that might actually be sensitive to water levels changing. So the consequence comes right to this to this. And we've filtered that uh, again through um, a process of which ones are priorities and which ones we actually have access to as well. So the process took 440 GDE, you're never going to manage 440. It's you know when we first did this, it would have been DC back then. Went, 440 high value GDEs. How can you do that? You know how, how can we manage 440? The number's too big. Don't know why it was too big. It just was in concept too big. So we went through a filtering process and ended up with 44 GDEs. So a high value. The critical component is that behind each GDE there's a logic of why we actually got there. We were pulled out of a, a box so we could explain you know the connection. Partially, and the next bit is the future work to do on these high value GDEs to get the information to actually develop management plans and to answer the, the conversation. So it's been a really logical process. You map them as many as you can and then you prioritise them. It's, it's straightforward, but it's, it's just you know, being done. And the only other place I think it's done is the Inter Peninsula in South Australia and Australia. It's actually gone through the process of filtering that have the high value. So the next bit is part of this, this process. Everything finishes with updating our little database. So this is an example of the, uh, the fields that are on our database. And some are obviously very easy to understand, like WPWRST rank. What? Yes. <laughs> um, but this is, this is kind of the information so that we're actually trying to populate on our database. The prioritization process was automatically updated in the wonderful world of GIS, the majority of these funny named ones over here. So at the end of the day, it's given us a prioritisation, it's given us a catalogue that we can actually move forward. So we can actually catch up what we think we've got out there. And the whole aim of this is so it's live. So if somebody goes out and finds something, we can add it. So it's meant to be a live updated database. So for our, the sake of this little story, we've actually gone out to um, Deep Creek, and we find out that we, 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 we care about Deep Creek, we want to know a little bit more about it. So the next step is to try and understand the site a little bit more. And what we've um, we've developed, we, with the help of Lisa when she was a vacation student in Melbourne Water, um, was this process about actually going out. We wanted a rapid assessment process, not something that took days, but something that most of the folks in Melbourne Water could go out and look at a GDE, understand it, <coughs> and go, yeah, I think that is happening there. So we would identify the GDE, whether it was through the Melwater GDE workspace, fieldwork, or the Bond Atlas. Then through the desktop study, um, we'll go on and show what we've done. We've created a template so you can actually do a desktop study using the workspace, and you update the catalogue uh, with the learnings. Following that, there's nothing like going out in the field and having a, a look at what you've got. So there's a there's a field assessment um, template along with a GDE handbook, which has got some ideas on types of veg and types of the um, hydrogeological settings you could be sat in. I mean, obviously you're updating the catalogue at every step in the process. And then the next steps, is it a GDE, isn't it a GDE? So it's not a GDE, we update the catalogue and we retire that site. Um, or we actually want to know a little bit further about it. So that's kind of the, um, the overview. And John's going to step you through the desktop assessment and the project assessment. Oh, yeah. So, the desktop assessment, slide coming up, um, has your classical heading, you know, your location, area, photos. It sucks in information from what's existing in GDE workspace, links to existing layers of geology, depth water table, and GHD catchment information, if you like. So, you hop on your computer and, and it populates as much as you can of what's known about this little spot on the earth. We haven't gone there yet. Um, it has, you know, location, um, you know, there might be a site map from, it shows the jet, the, the, the catchment area, it might show the roads, the, the landscape that it is, but it gets ideally automatically populated. You know, the aerial photo um, of wet and dry periods, so you might see whether the wetland is holding water, what have you. You import information to the GD catalogue. Um, I won't go into all these, but around the geology, the depth of water table mapping, um, 
you know, the flow path gets populated, whether there's a big catchment or a small catchment. You know, previous studies, do we have an overall value? Have we actually identified before? Have we, have, in the sensitivity analysis of this framework, what is its value? Does it have a sensitivity? Do I care about it? You know, you go and talk to people, do we have previous studies? You know, and we can go to VVG, Victorian Visual, you know, v, vis, Visualise the Victoria's groundwork, sorry, and we can look at maps of groundwater or, or associated landscapes of the hydrogeology. So we've populated all, sucked in there at its best, and you haven't left the best yet, but you already have an idea of where you're going, what kind of landscape it is, what information you understand about it already. So that's pretty cool. We then go and inspect it, because often when we do these things, desktops are not good to use. Um, you know, the best one I've ever come across was in the Lemoy Valley, where Map, we use remote sensing, we map this area because of DBE, it's really high, we went there, there's nothing there because it was a, the survey had come and cleared all the willows from the drainage lines and by the time we did the remote sensing, by the time we actually went out and did the field. So desktop studies can, can be wrong. So we, we go and do field work, which is great. I love field work's good. Um, picture our job. So the point, there's this question, the, the point of the, the field assessment is it, it basically just asks you questions. About it. And the questions are around um, answering, do I, am I going to walk away from here thinking ground was connected? That's, that's what the questions are really aimed at. So, you want to? No? no? Excellent. <laughs> um, so, you want to know whether it's wet or dry? You know, we want to, we want to do a sketch. We want, want people to draw the, the landscape. And, and we've, uh, we've we went out and we did this. It's an interesting thing. You go to the landscape, draw. Draw the landscape, it forces you to the person to actually look around the place. It's taking you from the desktop to the landscape. Where's the creek? Is it wet? How many is it bit of Are there drains? All these kind of questions that you actually have to physically draw. It's a really good thing to do, it doesn't take you long. We do a sketch. Um, and it's, there's more questions, you know. Are there any other surface water sources? You know, open water flowing, open water pooling. Is, is there evidence of groundwater discharge? I know they're really simple questions, but unless you ask them, you can't actually answer them. So it forces you to do that. Evidence of other sources of groundwater, the drains, etc. You know, is it, it does look like it's persistent in dry period. Um, you know, is it similar to other landscapes around it? Is there moist soil? A whole heap of questions. Uh, do we have iron staining and salt salt reference that, that might be indicative of groundwater discharge? So there's a whole heap of um, information and there's a handbook we did. So is the vegetation greener and healthier than the surrounding landscape? Really simple observation that can actually tell you the shallow water table type. Um, is it dense? Whole different questions, we won't go into them all. Um, are there special aquatic ecological? Is there, is there persistent knowledge of, of aquatic vegetation? So it goes, goes through a series of questions. Um, you know, I, I won't go through them all. And eventually, where's the final question? Um, do you think this is a GDE and why? It takes you to the response. So, and you're sitting there going, I don't know. Um, is there a groundwater discharge? Yes, no. Shallow groundwater table because of vegetation observations that I've made. Takes you through a suit, indicative species. Do I have Phragmites? Do I have wood tree? You know, do I have vegetation that is indicative of using groundwater? Um, if somebody told me there's a platypus here, what kind of information? So it, it, it's not a yes, no, it's, it's kind of a likelihood. It's kind of ticking the boxes. You've got to make an assessment at, at the end. Um, of what you think, and you can sort of make summary comments here. Yeah, I think it is pretty much related to groundwater, and uh, it's actually an old septic tank, it's not actually doing groundwater at all. And you know, you, you keep on going through the, the process, and uncertainty is action. And you know, when completed, please call, I like that one, when completed. <laughs> yeah, don't do anything, so. Don't do it, it's not, it's not a yes no thing, it's about trying to, and there's a handbook which we'll, we'll get into, it's trying to look at the key features of a rapid assessment of whether there's groundwater connection or not. Because we can't always go and do a bore, although as hydrogeologists we love to make holes. Can we do this? Yeah. So the handbook is, can you copy the handbook here? Yeah. Um, not everybody understands um, how groundwater might come, come to the surface. So there's a, a handbook we've got of, of typical little diagrams of Conceptual diagrams of why groundwater might come to the surface. Typical photos of vegetation types or wetland types that are going to be connected to the groundwater. So when you go out into the field, you've got a whole lot of photos and little conceptual diagrams of, of, 
Um, but this is tailored obviously to Melbourne, Melbourne water. And we had some the vegetation and um, people and other people look at it. So you don't have to be a hydrogeologist to really get a feel for why groundwater by actually come to the surface. I think it's worth saying Johnny's face from the Humber the Golden Murray Water, water started. Started, So yes. um, working with, with Brendan from the Royal Water Authority up there um, has been invaluable. So they really started well, that they, and just adapted it. They wanted their diversion officers for a new license when they're going out there and they had to take <coughs> it to the GDE and the diversion officers are saying, well, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> so we developed a, you know, within you know, two, well, a kilometre of it, if you find a wetland that's got the ring of those trees, the red gum, and the basalt plain, you know, north of Paris, well, it's going to be a GD. So I'll say, that's exactly what it looks like. Yeah, it is. So we did a, a simpler kind of version for, for them so they'll suddenly think about the landscape in their assessment. The handbook um, how it gives you conceptual models and where that conceptual model, that style, Ground. This is a fracture rock aquifer that along the fracture there might be springs and endless springs. And there's a map of where that flat landscape exists so people can, can sort of work out where they are and what kind of. Um, there we are at Donnybrook. And there we are at Donnybrook Spring. So we, we go out there, we've got an idea of the landscape we are, we've got a little model of the kind of way groundwater is actually going to come to the surface. And then we go through that process. We update the database. The information is continually being captured, and that's that's the real key. It's it, 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 you know, if you get hit by a bus, I can say that of course. <laughs> um, if you get hit by a bus, it's okay. It's not really okay. It's kind of okay because we've updated all the information in the catalog so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> our investment. So we found a high value, potentially high risk GDE. And our next thing, step that we've um, developed is a standardised template that actually does meet the national framework and the GDE catalogue. And this is a process that we've um, developed to, to uh, deliver a conceptual understanding. The way we've developed this process is in several steps. So the first step is we undertake a literature review, which produces um, a template with um, standard questions that kind of ask you very direct questions um, to actually go and find that information. I think, I think Louisa came out and was part of this process where we looked at Mary and, and Darabin. Um, and the next, so the next type of step is actually going out on a site visit, talking to those local experts, those folks that have lived there for many moons and know far more about the site than we do in just the one day that we actually go out and visit. So it's, it's talking about the site, it's, it's opening our eyes to road cuttings, to scoria cones, and all these wonderful things that I've learned from just going out in the field with John. So the rocks go one way that way and that way. It's just opening your eyes and seeing what's out in the environment. Then we come back to the office and we develop a draft conceptual model. So we, you know, some of the times we've gone out with site visit and our total conceptual model has, has, has changed. And then from that we produce what we call a final conceptual model. And our next step is producing what we call a live version. So this conceptual model approach actually gives us three outputs for three kind of different audiences. It gives us a template with some very detailed technical information. If you're a GDE geek, John, um, you can look at that. Um, if you want to look at the more um, just conceptual, the A3 picture, there's some nice pictures in that, that's great. And we're trying to create these light versions, which hits a lot of um, different audience targets. So the key question we're trying to understand is what role is groundwater playing in this environment? If it wasn't there, what would be there? Just a dry dust bowl? We don't really know. Um, so I'll let John explain what happens at Deep Creek. Well, I hope you can all read that. A few of the So what, what we try and do is take a lot of information from about 12, 18 pages in, in the template and background. Suck it into key paragraphs because we found out that, you know, lo and behold, people don't read reports, um, and but they read bits, and these have been really invaluable. They've actually changed the way um, people have done things because really, really quickly, you can take people through the process of. Um, here's a whole different hand. Out. Where am I in the world? We can do some cross sections, depth of water table. That's the, the flow path modelling. We can take a non hydrogeologist geologist and we can show them the different rocks, the structures, 
where the water table might be because of the local information that there are some springs um, at, at a regional scale. The critical thing is we know that groundwater is fed because of, of, of joints and faulting. We've got some information that was in the GD catalogue about groundwater flow paths. And then there's little pools you know, that are, are fed because there's fractures and faults driving the groundwater. There's little fishy and when Deep Creek stops flowing, these pools are still there. There was some work done by Radon, uh, Ann Cartwright did some Radon to prove that these pools are fed for groundwater. And little fishies <coughs> that survive in these, these little pools um, have been from drilling there recently. So, and if you were to take the groundwater away from there, there's no surface water, dries out, the fish die. So that's a really simple explanation of it, but that's the idea of the tool, the idea of it that in a very short period of time we can display the geology, the groundwater, <coughs> the top diagram is what's the linkage between what we're caring about, which is the fish, and, and the groundwater, and, and how, how do we make that connection? Because people don't understand what's underneath their feet because we can't see it. So these diagrams try to make people see the three dimension of what groundwater really, really is. Hood Brook was a little bit different. It, was a, um, it wasn't a river, it was a, a wetland within an urbanised landscape if you like, um, and here in, on, on the peninsula. And what we know about it is we've got a, a, a wetland area, we've got a golf course that's using water, we've got a lot of irrigation coming out of, of, of a deeper, deeper aquifer, so we've got groundwater use, we've got the seawater intrusion issue if, if it used to occur or has occurred. And when we looked at the information of Took Rook, what we found through other reports, not related to groundwater, not related to GDU, but that's the problem soil. So the critical issue here, if it's looking after the vegetation from a groundwater point of view, um, and the vegetation is really the value in the bird that, that took the look of, if you dry it down, you're going to have an excess of soil. So the groundwater service that took the look isn't really supplying water for fish, it's maintaining the saturation of excess of soil. Different landscapes have a different critical role that groundwater plays. So if you take groundwater away from took the look, you've got the acidity issue. So that's what each diagram is trying to do. So go to the developer or somebody, why can't I take groundwater away? Very quickly you can go without making a tedious process going, this is the way groundwater is important to fish and fish. Take in mind through the program that you've already gone through a desktop sort of process, field investigation process, and what it's led to, well, the, the next one's about what... Yeah, so yeah. I guess we've understood the role of groundwater here, but um, this is still in the kind of engaging and um, exchanging of knowledge we wanted to know the condition of our GDEs and how they were tracking sort of project, trajectory kind of process. Um, so we've, we've really focused on wetlands. We haven't got quite got our head around streams. Perhaps we'll look at you know, the stream condition. SKM review various methodologies to actually undertake this. Um, we'll talk condition assessments of the work that I was familiar with from the water framework back in the UK. That didn't work. Quite a complicated. Um, and where we've looked at identifying the index of wetland condition, a tried and tested methodology here in Victoria, and linking it with what's called the index of groundwater condition that didn't quite make it out in the, into the big wide world, but some wonderful thinking that went on behind it. Bill Pappas from ARI has been the driver behind this with Doug Frew and Andrea White, um, Damien Cook as well, being really good to add so much value to this. And at the end of the day, um, we've looked at we're still developing what we call an index of wetland condition for groundwater dependent ecosystem wetlands, IWC, D, D, W, um, and it's got about 15 measures in it. So there's five new ones in there, for those of you familiar with the index of wetland condition, there's six from the index of wetland condition, and three mod modified from the index of groundwater condition. That's what that should say, my fault. Um, and what it looks at um, quickly, um, it just looks at the index of wetland condition for groundwater dependent ecosystems. It identifies some sub indices, some components, and some measurables. So you can actually go out there, look at these things, and sort of tick a box and just work out how that site's, site's travelling. This is, this is work that's very much in process, and that's going through a presentation that's delivered on Tuesday. Once again, as part of the process, you update the catalogue. Um, we're just going into the last <laughs> few slides, honestly, I think we could give you guys a break. Um, but the final part of it is the actual delivery. So we've mapped our GDEs, we've understood them, we've got this conceptual modelling, so what do you do about it? Um, and we've worked to develop what we call these GDE management plans that set out a management objectives, how we want to manage that site, 
It looks at recommendations on influences on the site and risks, on the groundwater catchment and on the regional scale. And um, John will just very quickly step through the different risks at different site scales. Well, the principle is that any, any scale of any landscape that gets energy in here, you have management action which is important. So the, the boxes here are describing that there's a hydrological basin You've got regional documentation, regulation, water supply protection zones, and you've got data that rel relates to it. So at the, at the big scale, you have strategy and catchment strategy that you can have management for for DZ. You don't actually have to wait until you get down to the nitty gritty before we have an option to imply influence. Groundwater flow system, the data changes. We've got you know um, impact zones or regulation or environmental flow recommendations and streams. You know, we've got desktop because groundwater flow system task mapping that we can respond with data and then we get the individual plan. So the GDE management plan concept is that as the principle that was developed in, in the GDE toolbox is that at any scale and any level of knowledge, you can intuitively provide an environmental water requirement for a DZ. You do not have to wait until you've got 10 years of data before you say, how am I going to manage a particular system? Because it's often not going to happen. So it takes so there's information you can give in terms of a management response any different scale, any different data level. Um, obviously, it's great to get your new individual GDE plan, but it's only going to happen until you really find those differences. It, 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 the plan is I suppose, a rapid thing as well that people can, can do. It sucks some information in the beginning. Where are we? Ground ground flow system site. This is uh, Deep Creek. You know, um, from from the GDE catalogue that exists. It's got to have a value and a sensitivity. We're going to link to the GD work, workspace. That the field, you know, there's been a desktop investigation, a field assessment, conceptualization. Where are they in that information? It makes you describe the threat to the GD. You know, is groundwater make, how does the groundwater maintain the ecology? Is the GD currently perceived to be at risk? How do I potentially impact? How am I going to impact it? What are any trigger levels, whether they exist or not? Because you're, you're trying to populate that. And it gives you, makes you fill out management objectives. Um, and it asks you to do those at different scales. So what can I do at a regional scale, intermediate and local scale? It takes you through that process. So it's quite a holistic way of managing. So this one, the, the local GDE boundary, you know, uh, you might have fencing, um, and if that local landholder was using that water for stock, you might evolve, you know, they'll actually, <laughs> in, in the cold broken, this one guy loved his rent at pool because he put his back pipe in it to fill his truck to go and feed it water his stock in the drought and come out the next day and the, the remnant pool was full again. It was brilliant, it was magic. So, you know, the, the option might be actually supplying different water to the landholder rather than sucking it in how I do it or when it pulls for competition. So, it, it, you fill it out and, you know, task, that completed. We've, we've thought about what the actual task that we have, or, you know, there's not an unlimited amount of options. There's actually only a really small amount of options that, in reality, in terms of managing these things, we think there's a lot, but there's actually not. Um, and then we can go through that process. Quickly. Go through that process. It's a quick process. It's a quick process. <laughs> and, and this is some results and... But then um, the, the, the final part of the story is that um, in some cases we may have um, data gaps and data knowledge. This is a project we've just been working on with um, with GHB about... The drill, the drill into the audience. <laughs> we, we, Tony and Jen and, and Matrix Drilling have drilled about 15 um, bores on what we call high value, high dependent sites. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, we're, and we're learning things from this, from this, from this drilling and we've also put in some surface water monitoring as well to complement the groundwater drilling hole. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. So just to close, John. So the concept of the GDE has actually worked. The acronym has actually worked, whether we want it or not. It's actually meant that we've now got these programs before it, we couldn't have done it. You know, <laughs> when I started doing this, we just didn't manage GDEs at all. The, the development of the concept led to management plan, which means we can now have a concept of how to manage our high value GDE, so that's really, really important. The holy grail, I reckon, in 10, 15 years, is we lose GDEs altogether as a concept and we actually simply manage water. So we're still silent. The issue of why the issue of groundwater came in, because we managed groundwater here in one building, we managed surface water over here, and it, it creates a disconnect. So we're heading away from that. Why are we heading away from that? Where we actually simply manage water. 
So hopefully groundwater disappears, the surface water will disappear, the rain we can actually put down the water and the ecosystem, all ecosystems need it. Because GDE has been a great concept and it's meant to be a considerant, but it's actually another silo in terms of how we manage ecosystems. So ideally, the Holy Grail is the Luzes acronym, the GDE atlas becomes the water atlas, and we just talk about you know, what are the water components of the ecosystem can be managed. That's where we need to go. Um, so some of those tools that you talked about, are they just for use in um, Melbourne Water or, they, or can they be used more widely and if so, can we share them on the RBMS website? <laughs> um, we've started sharing them um, across the state, so we <coughs> presented it back to um, our, my colleagues across the other CEOs who have seen some of this stuff, stuff before. Um, and Deppy are actually rolling it out into Gippsland where they're going to do five conceptual models. Happy to share um, any of the outputs, some of the conceptual models, so we can put some of those up on the mm -hmm. up on the webpage. Because the more people that know about these conceptual models, the better. I'm happy for the presentation to go up on the webpage and site and share that as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, and definitely it's all about sharing sharing knowledge for me personally. That's what I think it's all about. Not somebody knowing something and somebody else knowing something and never influential me. And I think that was the beauty of perhaps Mary and Dover and Louisa when we both went out there. And you were telling us stuff that we didn't know and John was telling us stuff that either of us knew. So it was, it was fantastic. So I'm happy to share some yeah. outputs and reactions. I'll check Josh. Yeah. Okay. Um, I suppose firstly, and this is sort of a two part thing, but when you're mapping um, groundwater systems, are you working within an ontological framework? Do you have, like, I see you have the database, yeah. Melbourne Water. Well, that's, yeah, so uh, from the Melbourne Water perspective, we started at looking at the wetlands that was groundwater dependent and the drought refuge reaches that we knew from internal Melbourne Water information. But the work that went on in the Atlas, John. Well, the, the attributes of how to describe it. And Sorry. the attributes of how to describe it, the headings in the database and the language used and what it is is actually consistent with the GD Atlas the National Framework for how to read. So is that a recognised metadata standard? Yeah, it is. is that? That's a recognised yeah. nationally accepted approach on how to describe and annotate the characteristics of the GDE it gets. Yeah. Accepted in by means that it had every national, every state was involved in the, the steering committee that work through that logic. It's like the definition of the GDE. The attribute table was agreed by the state. So when we when we talk about residence time or we talk about episodic and permanent and we talk about surface water expression or subsurface expression, all the terminology that exists within that are, are compatible with the national framework of how to describe. It's not as rigid as the soil classification framework, but it's national but it's it's it's, it's trying to do that in terms of GDE. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a national schema that ideally if in the world as the GD Atlas and the Bomb website was updated, the information collected here, you know, people who deal with databases, I'm going to simplify this horribly, sorry. You can you can press a button and up it goes. <laughs> but at least it's in a similar um, construct and it's not different headings, it's not different logic that it then gets updated to the national framework here. And Queensland are very keen to update the Atlas as well in terms of their, their doing the dip, their wetlands have got a similar attribution as, as well. So there is a national approach here. Yeah. So it's, um, I, I was, so given that broadly GDE is if and, and my particular interest is in a valley in the middle of nowhere, but there's a valley four which is regularly periodically regularly inundated with water. Um do wetlands fall within GDEs yeah. or wetlands so, a separate consideration? No, 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 no. So in terms of the new language, you don't use rivers, wetlands, streams, you get rid of them all. I don't care if it's a wetland, I don't care if it's a river. So yeah. what it is, is the surface expression of groundwater, as in groundwater comes to the surface. Yeah. It can be in a river or wetland or whatever. Yeah. I don't, I, or it's a subsurface expression of GDEs, where the water table doesn't come to the surface, but the trees, roots are using that groundwater. 
any that can be any landscape. I don't care what it, yeah, yeah, yeah. groundwater comes to the surface. And the reason we landed on surface expression and subsurface expression was because if you went to WA, they don't have wetlands; they have damp lands. Yeah. You know, well, what's a damp land? What's well, a wetland? But I'm in WA, so I'm going to be a culture. I'm going to say you don't know anything about WA because you use the word damp land. So we had this language issue. So we just scrapped it all: wetlands, springs, soaks. Don't it, groundwater comes to the surface. Ecologically, the principle is surface expression of groundwater and the ecology relies on that. Subsurface expression of groundwater and the ecology relies on that. So it can be any landscape yeah. where that occurs. Julia? Uh, yeah, I've got, I really like the work you're doing. I've got two questions that sort of are opposite ends of the process. One is that you said you had 440 potential GDEs and you whittled them down to 44. As a priority. As a priority. What, you still care about the other what happens to the <laughs> other 90% of them? And then the others at the other end of the process, the management plans which are coming out of this. Now, the Water Act is under revision at the moment, and it seems to me that a lot of statutory management planning is going out the window, certainly in terms of surface water. I'm less sure of what the new provisions are about groundwater. So I'm really concerned about, you know, having done all this work, what is the status of a plan that comes out at the other end of it? So the first part of the question, um, you know, we, we care about all 440 or potential GDEs, but we had to prioritise our time and effort. Yeah, but I, as, I understand and, that you need to do that. And, and the workspace that we've got, um, when we roll it out um, to the rest of the business, if, if a river health officer is working on an area, we've got this huge asset management project going on, but they should be able to go to that area there's a potential GDE there, and that might be able to link in with that stream frontage assessment, so that it can work, it can work that way. So that's a kind of a reactive approach, and then the proactive is more for the high value, high risk sites. Um, the second part of the question, the uh, management plans are something that we've developed internally, once again to assist perhaps the river health officers on a on a local scale, but also to work with and influence other stakeholders and key policy decision makers. So. The Merry Creek, for example, is a lot of development happening in that part of the world, and it's about getting involved with that integrated planning conversation early on to demonstrate the value of um, groundwater in that catchment and the potential risks and threats and how we can work together for a more integrated management solution at the end of the day. So they're not statutory, um, but they do identify... We've investigated, we've spent a lot of time and investment looking at these sites, so what can we do practically on, on the ground? Yeah. Who can we work with? Who knows a bit more about this site? We're working with some raw water from an extractive perspective. We're working with Melbourne Water Diversion Guides from a surface water extractive perspective. So now they're not um, statutory. There is work coming out, ministerial guidelines are looking at the impact um, on, um, on GDEs from an extractive perspective. So there's guidelines coming out around that. So it's out sort of consultation um, within the, the CMAs at the moment. I'm not too sure on the timelines of that. There are things that are coming out, um, and we've come such a long way when you look, the Water Act just said take due regard for the environment, that, that was it. Um, but now we've got sort of direction in the state-wide river health scheme, what's it called? <laughs> strategy. <laughs> yeah, and then we've got the healthy waterway strategy, so are we just, are we just getting to know a bit more, we're just trying to um, share, that, share that knowledge and, and influence where we can work with those who we can, really. Any other questions? Ben? Yeah, um, thanks for that presentation, it was really, really good. Um, I think you made the, um, that assessment process seem really simple and you sort of said that we don't need other geology experience and so on, but what, what happens if, if somebody does an assessment and it comes back and says, we don't consider this a GDE? Is that, what sort of QA processes that are in place, is that, or does it go up the chain to somebody like John or Sarah to say, hang on, let's do it. I guess the way we've developed the process, so it is quite easy for folks across the business to go out with the desktop and the field um, assessment. More likely than not, it'll be folks within the environmental water team that have got a bit more groundwater knowledge and expertise. And that's why it says hand it back to the environmental water team, because we manage that database, we're kind of responsible for it, retiring it. And, and retiring it means it's still there. So if someone finds out about it in the future, we, they can actually go and have a, a look and it's um, still still sitting there. So it comes back to the team. But if there's a gut feel that actually next door, we, we knew there was something happening 
there, and you might include it in the, the further information. But it comes back to the team as a sort of a QA process. So given that potentially any area is a, a DWE, what intensity of data are you looking at coming out of the groundwater and what frequency of that data rate? Well, so assuming you're drilling a bore which comes at X cost, where does the data lose value in, in relation to your data stream? Like is it quarterly? quarterly data adequate or, or monthly or seasonally seasonal data or, or like what what inputs do you need data inputs slight to data data given does, that it's infinite but data, yeah, yeah, data is interesting observations to me that a, 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 a valid data set is in the hole too if I go to a place and I see groundwater flowing out of the ground well that's groundwater you know, so there's different I don't think I could fully actually answer your question. Um, and it's, it comes down to the, the principle that Sarah put up to start, which is this appropriate level of investment. So this isn't going to happen with every DBE at all. It's only going to happen because the person got a threat occurring and we know about it and care about it. So I, there's no restrictions. We've got no, I mean, the data log is the big data log, which you know, you just get as much information as you can justify in your, your investment strategy and make. I'm talking for a manager here, and I'm not a manager of systems, but you then make decisions based on the information. So there's no restrictions on the data. There's no restrictions on it. It's no, no, I recognise that, but at what point do you have adequate data to make an assessment without leaving your office from Borwell, or from Borwell, for example? Well, the idea, you have adequate data at any stage in an investment. The principle, for me, the principle is you don't have to know everything, but you can make an assessment. If you come across river red gums and you've got no knowledge, no bore, and you, at the minute we've got a bit of information, generally you know river red gums use groundwater, right? Generally they do. So is there a risk? It's a small risk, but yeah, it's there because it's that kind of species. I haven't gone to the site, I haven't drilled a hole, but when someone says, do I need to consider groundwater here? I'd say, yeah, you probably do. And then if you come to a wetland, it's permanently wet, it's got fish in it, you know, and we've had fish in it during the drought, you go, that's really going to be connected. I'm still at my desk, but why is there fish in there in, in the drought? It's got, it's got a rare fish in it, so let's go drill some holes. So at every stage, in that diagram, you can make a management decision in terms of environmental water requirements, and you have as much confidence as you do. Ideally, you head down to the, at that diagram, down to the bottom right, where you're drilling holes and you're developing almost a responsibility. So what's the cost of drilling a hole? I don't know. Depends how deep the hole is. You know, it's <laughs> well, investment appropriate. What, so for example, in the Yarra Valley, clearly you're not going to go down three caves. No, no, no. You're no. Going to, so you're looking, yeah. in, the, in the valleys, you're looking at the alluvial deposits, yep. I guess. Very shallow, yeah. You might find a few rocks, but broadly you're looking at what, eight or 10, 20, 100, I don't know, probably, I mean, looking at the valley curves now, I would probably expect Ten or twenty meters would cover the groundwater, perhaps. I don't, I don't know, but, but when you're drilling for alluvial soils, you you're not looking at days' worth. You're looking at a day or two days. We well, look at it days and days. So investments relative to the risk. The investments relative to the but, appropriate. But, but, well, yeah, the investment. And I hear this a lot. But disregarding the cost, what are the parameters for the drill? So, so the water table. You got to intersect your water table. So you got to intersect the water table. And you want to know that you're in the aquifer that's supporting the base of the ecosystem. And through alluvial soil, so I don't know, 100 meters at 10 meters a day, 20 meters a day. I don't know. Soil. I don't. I don't quite understand what you're trying to ask in terms of what we're trying to. What about some indicative costs from some of the bores that we've put in at Melbourne Water? How much are we talking about conservation bores? Well, it comes again down to the the type of drilling. The actual, what you're actually drilling through, that still costs a lot more than going through alluvial um, deposits. Um, it's two to five thousand dollars per hole. Yeah. Oops, thank you. As a ball, <laughs> a ball pass to you. Yeah. Two yeah. Out of the About 15 or 17 bores that we've installed, they're generally around those 10 meter mark, five to 10 meter in depth. 
Yep, through the original system. That nested site where we want to get an understanding of the fluxes between the yeah. deeper stuff and the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the deeper stuff. The deeper bores might be sprinted into the new system. I'm, I'm looking at below drill values, so I'm not expecting particularly the croakers. Yeah, they're pretty quick yeah. to drill, and yeah, two to five thousand. Yeah, and that's including the casing, cap, the yeah. whole lot. Yeah. The bigger bit is getting all the permissions to actually drill the hole. That can take up. And, 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 and those <laughs> costs are acknowledged, but, right, but the conceptually, the yeah, they're um, fairly so relevant. Yeah, yeah. You know, in, in some respects. Okay. Any last questions before we wrap it up? The other one for John. Yeah. How long does the water have to un be underground before it's considered groundwater? So we came up with the definition of groundwater, and I lost a year of my life doing that too, because in Tasmania, groundwater and definition of groundwater is called unsaturated water. So all water below the land surface is groundwater in Tasmania. And there is not a national definition of groundwater. We couldn't agree <coughs> on a national definition of groundwater. And there were fights over this because it's, it, it, once you define something as groundwater, you've got to license it. And a lot of places don't want to define groundwater at all. So there are states that don't have a definition of groundwater in their policy. So um, the best definition I've ever heard really is, is it's saturated. It's, it's saturated um, you know, to the point that you've got pressure impacts on the atmosphere. And the other one that I was told is you can pump it. So you can't pump unsaturated soil. So how long does it have to be on it? A second. But we didn't win the battle coming up with the definition of groundwater. We lost that one. It's amazing. You think, you know, geez, we, we've done this for so long, there'll be a definition of groundwater. No. Couldn't get the states to agree and you walk away from it in the end. Which is great that the groundwater is a kind of ecosystem out which doesn't have a definition of groundwater. <laughs> <laughs> we might wrap it up there. Uh, I'll just... So we'll make this available on the RBMS website. Thanks, Sarah. Yep. And hopefully some documents as well. We'll share, yep. share. Yep. And we'll update that in the next couple of days. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.